Today we discuss photographing from unique angles. Hi, as always, thanks for joining me. I'm your host, Steve Brazel, and this is Behind the Shot, the show where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion, all the stories and challenges that happen in between. With this episode, and for that matter, with every episode, you can see the show notes at behindtheshot.tv. You can check out a blog post that I write about each individual guest. I kind of research them and check out their bio and kind of come up with just my thoughts of this guest or for that matter, my past interactions with the guest. And then I also have a small gallery of their work to kind of showcase the type of stuff that they shoot. And I have all their links, websites, social media, workshops, projects, all of that type of stuff. So again, head to behindtheshot.tv. You can get it all there. You can also find all the links for subscribing in your podcast app, whether it be audio or video that you choose. And today's guest, I met this gentleman at WPPI through a mutual friend by the name of Scott Heath. And when I first met him, I was like, "That uh, can, can you introduce me? Because I've followed this guy on Instagram for the longest time. And I was super nervous when I met him. And it's an understatement to say that I'm nervous now. I would like to welcome to the show, Canon Explorer of Light, Terrell Lloyd. How are you, sir? Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. Doing great. Thanks it's for It's good to great see you. And well, thank you. Uh, it's actually you. You know, I mean, <laughs> we were talking about it in the green room. But before I get into your introduction, I got to cover some of this stuff behind you, right? So you've got on your right or left, you've got, it looks like a G drive raid. You've got a Pegasus <laughs> raid. Uh, based on what you shoot, it makes sense that you're going to have mm -hmm. lots of storage. What are Correct. all the footballs behind you? So some of those are um, ones I've collected over over the years, some autographed by players, some of my favorite players. Uh, some are some game balls for uh, uh, community relation events that we've done. And, you know, I'm trying to be a little collector. I don't sell anything, but this is just for my own private uh, private collection. I like it. I like it. So being as how there's footballs, People who don't know you are people who are listening to the audio version because about half listen on audio. Okay. It's going to make sense as we introduce you. You are a San Francisco-based sports photographer. Correct. But your actual title, you work for the San Francisco 49ers. You are the senior manager of photography and the lead team photographer. Please tell me what that has got to be like. Well, you know, it's like one of those uh, dream jobs that that – you know, happened to come along. You know, I was a season ticket holder sitting in the stands, taking pictures from the stands back in the day. And, you know, fortunately, I got on the field in uh, 1994 to cover a game. And, you know, it was like a shot in the arm of adrenaline, you know, and wanting to get back down there. And I had this pipe dream, you know, I said, man, it'd be great to get with the 49ers. And in 1996, um, I got with them indirectly working with their entertainment group. And, you know, just weaved and worked my way, you know, 25 years later, you know, I was contracted for about uh, 17 years, 16, 17 years. And I've been full time for the past six years since we opened up uh, Levi Stadium in 2014. Well, and, and again, not just lead team photographer, but you're in charge of all that photography type stuff because it's more than just you on the team, right? Oh, this is correct. So when I say, know, when I say on the team, I mean, on the photography side on, team, on the photography side. So when you look at it, you know, a lot of people always ask, you know, well, what are you doing when there's off season? There's really no off season. So when you, um, when, if you looked at it from my standpoint, we're responsible for everything that goes on in Levi stadium, all the events that go on. If you have international soccer, we're responsible for that concerts. We photograph that. So if you look at our stadium, our stadium is more like uh, a convention center. Right. And so you have to document that. And, and in order to get other um, uh, large events in there, when they're putting putting together presentations, they want to show what was going on there, you know, the previous years. Then, you know, we're responsible for if you look at marketing partnerships, community relation, uh, ticket sales, um, our foundation, you know, football operations, which is the football side of it. Um, right. The business side of it, the business side of it. So in a whole, we're still working year round because there's events going on during the off season, but yet then we're winding down the regular season with all the, you know, 500,000 plus images that we take. 
And then we're ramping up for the new season, getting ready for that, you know, and then we do all the team pictures, the headshots, you know, everything that's related with our social media, uh, our design team, you know, uh, I mentioned the marketing group, um, my crew um, is responsible for all those assets. So, so it's become a full-time, full-time job. I've always got, you know, just like I write the blog post thing, you know, I don't take a a bio and put it in verbatim. I kind of use mm -hmm. parts of it, but I kind of write my own stuff. And you, and I do the same with each show, right? I have notes that I'm going to go by just so that, because a lot of times it's like, I got to ask this, I got to ask this right. and I don't want to forget. But you said something that is not in my notes that I'm curious about. And that was, you started with them in 96, but you said before that, I think you said 94, you ended up, I forget your exact wording, but something to the effect of, I ended up, you know, on a side, on the sidelines. Right. How did that happen? How do you first get, because I've tried, the radio station I worked for used to carry the San Diego Chargers, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but, and we used to do a lot of stuff where our morning show would go down during their trainings and stuff like that. And I went, hey, I do concert photography. You know, I'm the station photographer. That was just not going to happen. How would you well, get on the sidelines of a game like that? Well, interesting story. So um, me and my son, when he was younger, you know, he's about three, four years old. And we used to go in a little hamburger place here where we lived. And one of the former players, you know, owned, you know, a little shop. And he said, hey, why don't you go out in the field and shoot? Because he knew I love photography. I was doing it a little bit part time. And I said, why well, don't shoot with a magazine or anything? You know, he says, well, I know the PR director, you know, give him a call. And, and I didn't call him because I didn't know him. The next year he says, hey, did you ever call my guy? So I ended up, he ended up giving him a call and he got me a pass on the field, right? But what happened was wow. when I walked up to the credential booth to pick it up, they said, oh, who are you affiliated with? And I was like, uh, well, you know, I just gave the PR director's name because he didn't have a pass for me, but they ended up giving me a pass. Right. And so I got on the field and it was like, you know, back shooting film back in the day and had a great time. And it was like, man, it'd be great to get back here. And the PR director says, I thanked him at the end. He says, well, give me a call next time I see what I could do. And he said, give him a call. So I gave him a call. He would say it every week. I would call him every week. And the Niners made the, the playoffs that year. That was the year they won the Super Bowl in 94, made the playoffs. So I called him like I knew him and he hung up on me. Right. And I'm like, oh boy, I messed up on that one. So the next season came and I said, how do I get down on the field? And so then I got with a small magazine. I mean, I had my regular job at the time working in Silicon Valley. And so I got with a small monthly magazine and I put in for credentials and the Raiders moved back up from LA and put in for credentials for the Raiders. So I was shooting football every Sunday, just learning and, and then showing up. And, and I tell this story to a bunch of photographers about, you know, it's more than just taking great pictures all the time. Right. Uh, one of the entertainment photographers came up to me about a year and something later after I was got credentials. And he says, Hey, Terrell, how would you like to do what I'm doing? I'm getting kind of older. My knee's getting bad, you know, come down to my office. And so I go down to his office and say, well, I shoot the cheerleaders, I shoot the check presentations, I shoot the entertainment, the national anthem. Um, you know, and then I asked, I said, Doug, why me? Why me out of all the people? I've only been here, you know, less than a year and a half. He says, you know, you come in here with a smile on your face. Your personality is great. I figured you'd be good for the job. And that's how I started making my way. And you know what? That cannot be overstated. Correct. When, when, when you're, when you've got a job, show up with the attitude, do the job. Don't make other people have to worry about your job. Don't make other people have to worry about you being on time. Mm. Uh, just get it done. And it's amazing how far that goes. You don't just shoot for the 49ers. Uh, you provide all the photographic services for San Jose state university as well. Yes. One thing that was interesting to me, cause I I've always known that certain office staff get championship rings but I uh, never thought about photography staff, but you do have a number of rings with San Jose State University. You have yes. two NFC championship rings with the 49ers. You're not wearing them though. No, no, no. <laughs> they're, they're in my trophy yeah. case. Another, yeah. <laughs> okay. I wear them when and I go this, out though. The do you really? If, you know, if we're, if we're at a convention or at a certain type of dinner or something like that, then, you know, cause it's good for storytelling to be honest. Right. Yeah. Oh, it's an icebreaker. There's no question. Correct. Excuse me. What, what is that? Uh, the one that surprised me was bowling. <laughs> so you've got rings from the pro bowlers tour and pro bowler league. Yes. 
you've got several 300 games for people who don't bowl. Those are perfect games. Correct. And you've got several 800 series. Do you still bowl? No, I don't bowl anymore. Once, um, it it was very interesting. I bowled starting off, uh, I was about 12, 13 years old when I first started bowling. And about time I became, I was 16, 17, I was averaging over 200. And I was, you know, made the all-star team in San Francisco. And I was one of the top junior bowlers growing up in the Bay Area. And so you had the, you know, you, as a kid, you have a dream and you're watching the Pro Bowlers Tour on ABC Wide World of Sports. And, you know, that was Grew my Grew up watching it. Right. And so that was my my passion, my dream of becoming the first uh, African-American to win a national title. And, and, and I was able to go out on tour. I wasn't as successful as I, you know, as it turned out, but, um, and that was due to a, an illness that I had in when I was 19 years old. And so, you know, physically, I just didn't have the strength after my operation to withstand a long haul on the tour. But right. then, you know, I did it full time for two and a half years. Like I said, I shot 300 games, I shot 800 series, you know, made some money. And, you know, when I came back, I said, well, you know, I just, I think there's another time. And then that's when I got into when I was going to college at the time, I was taking computer science classes. I came back and and got a job in uh, Silicon Valley working. In, uh, and that a, was the other thing I was going to say was, yeah. and I've I've discussed with this with another, another uh, blah, a num- number of people, don't know what just happened. Right. Um, I've discussed this with a number of people, but the number of photographers who also have an IT background, Aunt Pruitt does, mm. uh, you do, I do, and a lot of photographers do. You've got, you've got three affiliations that I love, right? Mm. Uh, Correct. Because, you know, every photographer that I've got on, and usually, you know, like you, Canon Explorers of Light, which are the top elite photographers that shoot Canon. Nikon, of course, has their ambassador series. Correct. But I, I read off these lists of affiliations or ambassadorships or whatever all the time, and some of them I use and some of them I don't. But you actually are affiliated with my three favorite products. I am a Canon shooter. I only use SanDisk cards and you're a SanDisk Extreme Team member. And when I shoot, I wear a think tank belt system. I all my camera gear is kept in a think tank international airport version too. There you go. Uh, you are a think tank pro uh photo pro team member. So the bowling may not have worked out, but you've gotten there, right? Your yes. client list though is interesting to me. Because in all the years I've followed you thinking sports, right? Thinking 49ers. Your client list includes corporate clients, Verizon, Intuit, Yahoo, BMW, Canon, of course, SanDisk, Mm -hmm. of course. Yes. uh, Ritz Carlton. But still your passion is sports, right? Correct. Correct. You know, it's funny how it's funny how that has transpired because I've always been what I want to say a forward thinker. I've always been, you know, pretty ambitious and 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 all the careers that I've done and everything that I said that I was going to do, I was going to be good at it, right? And I put a hundred percent into the craft that I did. And on the corporate side, when I started my photography, because I took photography in school, and then also I was bowling, and then I you know changed that, and then but I still always had a love for photography. But what happened was when I was working corporate in my IT job. You know, a friend of mine was getting married and he asked like, hey, you want to do some pictures for me? And I said, well, I haven't shot in a while, but I picked up my camera and shot a wedding and it came out pretty good. So that's when I started this. Which is business. one of the hardest things you can shoot, by the way. Right. Right. I mean, it was a backyard wedding, but, you know, it worked out pretty well. But I always had a love for photography. So then when I quit the Pro Bowlers Tour and I started honing my skills on photography and I joined our local photographers group here in the Bay Area. It was called, it was called uh, Professional Photographers of the Greater Bay Area. And, and and these photographers were serious photographers. It was, you know, back in the day, they were shooting Veronica and Hasselblad's and medium format and everything like that. And I'm like, well, okay, well, if that, they're doing that. And I, you know, had a couple of mentors that mentored me along the wedding side of it and and the portrait side and started going to these photography classes. And then that's when I started honing my skills. And then, you know, and still meantime, shooting sports where I was contracted right. with the team still indirectly, but making my way during that time. And then a lot of um, clients, corporate clients would come in and they would say, hey, do you do events? You know, I never did events before and started doing events. And then that started to grow. And then I started to meet people. But one thing about me is like I, I embrace technology. And that's one thing I try to tell photographers today to embrace technology, because when you look at when I started and what really got me in the door with the 49ers 
was my first digital camera that cost me $12,000. You know, it was, right. uh, it was a Kodak back with the Canon body, uh, the DCS 520. And that's what really got me in. And so everything else, it's like, you know, when they started doing, they had, uh, uh, Fuji had a, a pictography printer. The printer was $7,000. The thing was big. It took two people to carry it. I used to take that to events. So I was doing on-site, on-site printing before anybody else. So the BMW job, how that came about was I was doing a gig in San Francisco for BMW, the Mini Coopers. And the director of the events, uh, the next day I brought back some 8 by 10s And he was so impressed by that. It was like, what, how'd you get these so quickly? And then next thing you know, right. I have a friend in them. We became friends. And then, you know, I worked for him with him for about almost 10 years. And then later on, it was a hiatus in the middle. And then later on, uh, there was like five, six years where they took me all around the world, Africa, Italy, Australia, uh, Argentina, uh, Monte Carlo. They looked, took me to the Olympics in 2012 with them. And it was really just shooting high end events. And that's how you know, a lot of, and then, you know, I had some other local clients with Rich Carlton. They would, you know, right. I worked with their events people and, you know, clients would come in there and, and they would refer me to uh, photograph all their events too. So that's how I built that. You you said something interesting and that is telling photographers to embrace technology. And again, it, for you and I who have a tech background, it's easy. Right. But I always tell people, I came to photography very late in life comparatively. And had I known that photography inherently is a geek sport, mm -hmm. I would have jumped in way, way sooner. So let's jump into some, some photography stuff here. Okay. First of all, shooting at the level that you do. For those people that are watching or listening that are your you know backyard sports photographers, right? Mm -hmm. They're like our mutual friend, Scott. He photographs his kids playing sports, water polo, whatever. Mm -hmm. What makes a good sports image? I mean, if you were to tell somebody in one sentence, this is what you've got to have, what makes a good sports image? Oh, I mean, if I had to say it in one sentence, I mean, it, it's it's not really all about like the capture of that that action, but it's capturing the moment, right? It could be it could be a moment of celebration. It could be a moment of um, you know a kid scoring a goal in you know playing soccer. It, it's like. It's so it's so broad and wide where, you know, it's when you look at sports, it's and you look at all the sports that goes on. It's it's all about moments, things that are happening in, in real time. Um, one thing I tell when I'm teaching is it's understand the sport that you're shooting. Right. It, it's like what makes. A great or a good photo. Right. And so what I used to do when I was coming up, I would look at the other photographers online and look at their work. Look at what they're capturing. Look at what they're, what, what I try to get into their mindset. What are they thinking when they took that photo? Right. And Which then is I would the go whole back point up. of this. Right. Exactly. Right? So, I mean, that's the whole point of this. Right. And I apologize for interrupting, but, but yeah. that is so key to me. It's why I started this show. Mm -hmm. Looking at photographers online and emulating them is it, okay. If that's what you got to do to start, that's great. Mm -hmm. But you got to dive deeper. You got to figure out. You got to interview that photograph. Right. So the one example is um, I was a photographer for a lacrosse team in San Jose for about two years, like uh, an outdoor team. And then and then there was an indoor team. I was their photographer for about a year and a half as well. I didn't know anything about lacrosse. So I started looking at other photographers that shot lacrosse and like what what made the photo, you know, was it the photo of them just running down the field with their their lacrosse stick or was it when they had the ball and the stick and they get ready to toss it to their teammate or make a shot behind the back. So those are some of the things that I was looking for. But then also I talk about too, in, in any sports, you know, it's like, it could be even in swimming, right? What the, for every action, there's a reaction. So like, say for swimming, you know, you, you're, you're photographing, like if I'm at San Jose state, and the, the women's swim team and they're racing, they're racing and they get to the finish line and they win. The shot is really at the end, not them in the water where you can see their face. Now you can get right. some great shots of them, but the picture is the one where their teammates are cheering and they're coming out the water in the expression there. So where that's what you got to jump up think. out and look back at the clock to find, you know, check time. Exactly. It's the same with live music photography. I tell people it's, it's yes, there's nothing like a hair whip. Right. There's nothing like a guitarist or whoever jumping in the air. But some of my favorite moments 
are when you see someone on stage. I'm thinking of a shot in my head, actually, of of uh, the lead singer of Corn, mm. Jonathan Davis. Um, when they just turn and you see them kind of look out at the audience and smile, and it's like right at that moment, he just realized. I'm on a stage in front of these people and he's soaking it in. And that has nothing to do with a hair whip and nothing Mm -hmm. to do with fast action. Those same people, you know, the backyard photographers. Correct. If you could give them one tip, what's the quickest way they can improve their family sports photos? Oh, the quickest way. I mean, I would say, you know, understanding the equipment that you have. And that you're using and the lens that you would use as well. I mean, it's kind of vital. I mean, it's like if you're shooting, you know, your kid sports and you only have a 24 to 70 lens, right? And and you're shooting too loose. You need something that where, you know, maybe at least uh, a lens where it's a 100 to 300. That's, you can get those, you know, with Canon, you know, where it doesn't cost you $5,000. You can get those, you know, relatively, you know, not to say inexpensive, but expensive enough to, to, um, right. To use, but it, it's, it's like when you're shooting too wide, it's like, there's too much information you're leaving out. And so you want to get something to get a little bit tighter. Um, and, and in photography, when you, when you look online, you could look online and, and go to some classes and listen to what the photographers are myself, or if I'm giving a class or something like that and explaining all the, the, the techniques about shooting sports and lighting and then f-stops shutter speeds isos and once you get those basic understandings together um it will work out pretty good too and now and some of the other cameras that you know canon has they also has they have a sports mode where you can dial it on sports mode and the camera will set up your settings automatically for you but also when it does that you also want to understand what those settings are doing so you'll know, okay, why am right. I shooting at five, six, at uh, thousands of a second at this ISO, right? You want to understand that on the back end as well. So one of the biggest, mis- I've told this story before, but one of the biggest mistakes I ever made was also one of my best learning experiences. Because when you were talking about lenses, what, the way I got into photography was my son was in marching band, high school marching band. I'm up in the stands. I want to be able to photograph him. I go in and I say, show me a camera. They showed me an entry Nikon and they showed me a Canon XTI. The Canon was just more comfortable in my hand at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he held up two lenses, 70 to 200, 2.8, or 70 to 300, 3.5 to 5.6. Correct. And he goes, and you'll want this one. And it was, you know, whatever, how much ridiculous money and the Mm -hmm. 70 to 300 was 800 bucks. And I'm like, well, first of all, the camera is black and the lens is black. Shouldn't they match? (laughs) Right. I don't want the white lens because it doesn't match. (laughs) And then the other thing was, well, 300 is more than 200. Right. (laughs) And so I'm shooting from the stands, not knowing anything about photography and just the mere act of zooming changed my exposure. Exactly. And I would go home and go, why are the ones zoomed out in, you know, exposed, right? And the ones zoomed in are suddenly, you know, two stops darker. It was actually the greatest thing I ever did because it forced me to learn my exposure triangle, to learn reciprocals, to understand what they mean. So yes, if you, if you buy a, a less expensive lens or if you shoot on sports mode, saying this for the benefit, you know, obviously right, of viewers exactly. and listeners. Exactly. That's great. It'll get the job done for you, but don't just do it and stop. Do it with the point of, again, dissect your photos, interview your own photos, find out what works, what doesn't. And, and I want to get into the shot here. Okay. Before I do, just a quick reminder to everybody. Make sure that you head to the website. You can find the website at behindtheshot.tv. I've got all the show notes for today. All the links for Terrell are up there. Uh, Some photos that Terrell has done, a little bit of his bio type information, stuff like that. And you can subscribe to this podcast in your favorite podcast app two different ways. So if you want to watch the video, subscribe to the video. If you want to just listen to the audio, it's a little hard because we're talking photography, but you you can always just go subscribe to the audio as well. Not a problem doing that. Um, But whichever one you end up subscribing to, 
Keep in mind, you can subscribe to both and just watch or listen at your choice. And of course, we're up on, on YouTube as well. So that kind of brings us to today's shot. Now, for today's shot, let me kind of set it up first, then I'll bring it up. It's a quarterback sack end zone from a very low angle. This is at Levi Stadium, right? Correct. Yes, correct. And to me, as I was sitting here trying to think about how I'm going to describe this shot, which you and I have talked about, and it's it's always difficult for me. But as I was dissecting this shot, this to me is the perfect moment to take a photograph. This is, this is the type of photograph that I know deep down in my heart, I would never be in the right position to get. Okay. So let me try and describe it for you. It's a Green Bay quarterback being sacked by four 49ers players. And for those of you on audio, I'm going to try and stress this. The camera angle is super. This is why I said unique angles is the title of the show. It's a super, super low to the ground angle. I mean, almost to the point where you can imagine grass if it was long enough coming up in front of the lens. Super, super shallow depth of field, obviously being created partially by the lens choice here. And there's dirt even flying up. And you see the goalpost in the background. You see the logos on the helmets. Just the right amount of stuff is in focus. Just the right amount of stuff is both foreground and background is soft. The other thing I just noticed as I was saying foreground and background is there's a pronounced amount of foreground as the players and the quarterback that are being sacked laying on the ground are at the lower rule of third. So you have a full third of the image below them fading from blur back to uh, full in focus. Just OK, so. I always want to get the technical stuff out there. And I know that some people are like, look, technical details aren't going to help you. But I, I like to get them out because some people want to know. It's a Canon 1DX Mark II. I believe it was a 300 EF 300, correct? 300 millimeter lens, yes. Okay. You shoot manual? Yes. And here's where it gets interesting. ISO 2000 F3.5 at 1 12 50th of a second. Now, let me ask this first, actually. Do you shoot raw or JPEG? I shoot JPEG because um, I'll, I'll shoot about seven, 8,000 images a game. And so the way, to me, the way um, cameras are today, it the way it processes a JPEG file is, is real clean nowadays too, though. Um, I have about, as far as my photography team during home games, I have about five, six shooters shooting different angles, different areas, different assignments throughout the game. So at the end of a game- right you know, we'll have anywhere from 25 to 30,000 images. So imagine 25, 30,000. Yes. Yeah. And that's with shooting everything that's pregame, you know, um, uh, postgame. I mean, we're getting player warmups. I mean, we're shooting around the stadium shots, so on and so forth. So imagine trying to process 25, 30,000 raw images. So it, it's not, I'll shoot raw when I have to shoot raw. And there's times that came across this year where I basically shot raw because and once we get into this, when I shoot with five cameras, when we talk about all my equipments after we get, you know, um, over on to this picture and stuff like that. But there's, yeah, I do shoot raw as well. But these I shot JPEG. Okay. So let, let me dive into this shot here really quick. Okay. First of all, the exposure. Correct me where, where I'm wrong. ISO 2000 was probably, you know, my thought always was pro football. They shoot at least one one thousandth. You're at one twelve fiftieth, so the I, the high ISO was so that you could get the shutter speed that you needed for this. Correct. Correct. That's correct. Okay, but the f three five is interesting to me. So you're shooting on a three hundred at f three five, three hundred millimeters away at f three five. Your depth of field is like almost neg negligible, and yet here, it's not. I mean, you've got a the a good amount of depth of field here. Yeah, so let me let me explain why three five. So so a lot of photographers and a lot of what we do, depending on lighting or how much light we want to have in, instead of shooting at two point eight, because you know your depth of field is going to be more shallow at two point eight, right? So here it's like back in the day at two point eight, sometimes you would lose a little bit where it just doesn't catch as much. But technology and right. cameras and and lenses have gotten a lot better since then. But the sweet spot for me and what you know some other you know tech photographers even from Canada would told me before where three to if you shot it right right around three two or three five right that's where your image is going to be a little bit sharper than 2.8 now you can still shoot at 2.8 and get sharp there's 
I'm not debating that. But what I want to do is if I got two or three players that's making a play, I want to, and if they're, if, if they're not in the same focal plane, if, if they're off a little bit, I want to make sure they're sharp a little bit. And I could do that at three, two or three, five. So basically okay. that's why, that makes sense. that's why I've done that. Now it's like, if I'm in a, if I'm in a stadium that doesn't have really great lighting, I'm going to shoot at 2.8 because I want to get as much light in as possible. And then, and now with, with even with the cameras today and with the Canon 1DX Mark threes, um, it's like, I wouldn't hesitate and shoot at 8,000 ISO, you know, with a faster right. shutter speed at three, five, because the images are so clean and, and, and the this way it is processes where, the file. Correct. Yeah. That's where the gear matters. Like I live at 2.8, right. but I'm shooting concerts where the light is literally non-existent. Exactly. And there are times though, that I'll go up to 3.2 or four. Now I'm on a 5D4, which doesn't mm-hmm. do as good high ISO as, as a 1D series. But when you're shooting, you know, obviously a 1DX Mark II, the frame rate is somewhat insane, 14 to 16 frames a second. Yeah. Are you shooting at that? Are you shooting those kind of bursts? Yes, or? I am. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So you're holding it down and click, 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 click. Exactly. Exactly. I love but that I'm also though. framing everything Not up so I, I can made, see everything. You know, people used to say, well, how do you how do you watch the game and shoot at the same time? So I had to learn that. And my early on in my early years, back in, you know, 96, 97, 98, you know, when I used to go out there and shoot, it'd be like, I'll take a couple pictures. Then I start watching and I'm like, Oh, I got to start, keep shooting. So I had to learn how to watch the game through the lens and memorize everything. I could, I could find almost any picture that I took in my memory. If I know I got that shot or not, if they were to say, if the Niners came back and said, Hey, turn, we were looking for a shot of um, uh, Jeff Garcia when he made a run against the New York giants and it was a touchdown here and there. And I know that I got one of those shots. Cause I remember that in my memory. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. How far away are you here? From, how from far this away? shot. Oh, so I am, I am, I am in the end zone, kneeling down on the ground, very low. And a lot of photographers lay on the ground to get these types of shots. Right. So, uh, another so you're photograph- full prone position. Uh, no, I'm not laying down. I got my knees down and I'm looking down, but I'm using a Canon angle finder that I put on the lens, right? Where it's like, it gets me low enough on the ground where I don't have to lay flat on the ground and bend my neck back, right? And so I pop this angle finder on and basically the camera is almost just sitting on the ground. The only thing that's under is my hand, right? So I'm in the end zone, say the left of the goalposts of this one here. And, and the way I do these shots is when the team's backed up backed up to about the 20 or the 10, depending on where they're at. If they're at the 10 or the five, then I'm going to shoot it with the 70 to 200 and it's going to be, you know, rack bound the 70 millimeters. Right. When they start moving a little bit further away and I still want to get that low angle, right. I was switched to the 300 and this one, I went to the 300 on here. And my thought process when I do these, right. Is to get as many low angles as I can, but then I'm keying on the linebackers coming in to, to make a quarterback sack. So I'm anticipating what's going to happen, right? And so, and, and it's funny because we, you know, number one draft pick, Nick Bosa was on one end. Uh, one of our linebackers, Fred Warner, that's in this shot is in the middle. And now what I have to do is either I'm going to key on Nick Bosa or I'm going to key on the quarterback, right? So what happens is sometimes I'll just key on the quarterback or I'll watch the linebacker coming in or the, the end coming in. Well, this one here, we were getting to, uh, uh, Rogers during that game. So I keyed on Rogers. And when he went to go left and right, that means somebody was coming. And then I started firing because that means our linebackers were coming in. And then that's when they made the sack. And I just laid on the shutter and just, boom, boom, boom got a whole bunch of series of that one image as well. And that's how, let's what, see. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, okay, but are you, obviously a 1DX is, higher level correct single point autofocus or canons have what what's called point assist they also have zones which do you use i'm on the single point because because basically it is dead center and because i am i am basically picking where i want to go and who i want to capture so you don't even move your focus point it stays centered right because there's so many there's so many bodies there's so many movements you know you got you know 11 guys on each side here and there so i have to like look through where i'm at and know where i want to go because i don't want the camera to choose because it may focus on, you know, the wrong individual 
um, right during right. that time. Yeah. So canons also have what's called case numbers. Correct. For for which for those that shoot other bodies, whether it be Sony or Nikon mm-hmm. or whatever, the case numbers allow you to say you know, how fast it will switch from a foreground subject to a background subject, how, Correct. how fast it adjusts during tracking. It's, it's a number of parameters that are preset, each also individually adjustable, Correct. but they're kind of preset up for different kind of, of use case scenarios. I had a conversation via email once with a, a Canon engineer about this. And so I'm going to guess that you're on case number four. Yes, I am on case number four. Correct. Okay, um, but then I also still tweak case number four as well. So it's like, I look at things where it's like, I tell photographers when I'm speaking, it's like, I've asked them, do you ever read the manual? And some photographer, do they take the camera out the box, start shooting and so on and so forth. And I say, you know, you should read the manual, understanding what your camera does, understanding the settings. I said, you know, all these settings are there for a reason and you tweak them to what your style of shooting is. Right. And so my thing is, it's like I read the manual. I don't want to say I read it from cover to cover, but certain things that I know I need to set, I'll ask certain questions from other photographers of what they're doing. I'll talk to some of my Canon people, what they think, right? And their mindset on why these settings are there. And then I'll tweak it, try it. And it's almost like cooking, right? You you take something from somebody here, something from here, and you say, okay, let me change these settings. Oh, this works well for what I'm doing, right? And then you just stay consistent with that. So I'm on case four. I tweak it a little bit. I uh, One of the settings, I'll put it on, you know, lock on to that subject to where it's like if I'm photographing you and something comes in between and then you passes, I still want to stay focused on you once that person passes, right? It so doesn't I don't, refocus quickly. It, doesn't re- it, it hangs right. back for a while. Exactly. And then like say for a camera, if I'm, if I'm in the end zone and I have like my 24 to 70 or 7200 that when plays are coming towards me, right? It's like, okay, and if I have to whip up the camera real quick, I may have that on a different setting to catch that person real quick and then lock on and catch real quick. But yet it's like, because I want, I don't want it to, to react slow. I want it to react quicker because now it's only one person. If it's a long play and they're coming down and and the ball's up in the air and I grab the 7,200 and I hit the shutter release, um, I want it to lock on and go. With as many shots as you guys shoot during a game. How many do you deliver per game? Well, as far as like what we keep or what we like, as far as like, yeah, like what you, you know, you shoot 7,000 shots during a game. How many right. of those do you turn in quote unquote? So after the editing process, um, I would say like for myself, it's like going through just game action. If I shot 7,000 pictures during that game um, and we had to edit it down and it was a good game and I had a good shoot that day. I would pull anywhere out right. from three to 400 images out of there. And that's just, okay. you know, but then, that's but what then I was again, going for is that. Right. But then again, you have a series of a bunch of images, but yet you pull the best one out of that series. But then also, if right. you look at, if you look at what our design team does, right, they'll take a burst of images, right? Where if you got 15, 20, 30 shots of something, and then they'll create a gift out of that and, you know, a little animation and then post that in real time. So we would have to send those in at the same time too, as well. But see, I I always find keeper percentage uh, key because people compare with what they see us post on social media and they're like, I'm just not that good. I'm not that good. And they don't realize you're loading, meaning the person saying that they're loading 3000 shots into Lightroom and they're liking 50 of them. And they're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm horrible. And what they don't realize is there are people who shoot 7,000 shots and they like 300 of them. Right. This is totally normal when Correct. you're shooting high end photography. Now for this particular shot, the whole point here again is mm-hmm. the low angle. I mean like super, super low angle, but you don't stay here. So I've seen the sidelines on an NFL game and it's not, mm-hmm. it's not thinned out. Right. I mean, there's a lot of people right. Correct. on the edge of a field. Correct. You're moving around that field. You Mm -hmm. see plays getting down there. Now, granted, we're talking 11 seconds of play and you've got time to move, but is there running involved sometimes to get here? Oh yeah. I I put in, I put in a lot of steps on the football field because I move around a lot. I, you know, I'll, I'll be in one position and I'll, I'll have my assistants with me and, and we'll talk about this on these low angles where, cause I shoot with five cameras. I shoot with a 600 millimeter, 400 millimeter, 300 millimeter, 70 to 200. 
24 to 70, right? And then in my think tank- um, That's as wide as you go? You don't do a 16 to 35? Well, in my, uh, in my think tank um, modular system, I have a 16 to 35. I also have 11 to 24. I have a fisheye lens. Um, I'll, I'll have an 85 one two. You know, I'll carry a flash with me at certain times when so I'm- So you're carrying, a th- you, you wear a think tank belt system. Exactly. Exactly. Because during pregame, you know, we've done a lot of things. We, you know, gripping grins with people here, players warming up. I'm creating certain things here, getting inside the huddle before we come back out on the field, you know, for the game right. when they're doing warm ups. And so what happens is I have to move around the field. So I'll have two assistants with me. So the low angle shots, like say that one was a defensive one, right? So I'll get down low, try to get that quarterback sack because those low angles, you know, when you're looking up, it just makes them look huge and big. Right. It just makes for a dynamic photo. Right. Compared to if you're just on your knees looking straight. If, if you were to shoot, photograph something and you're standing up. Right. Your your view is different than when you kneel. Right. Your perspective is different. Now, then when you get low on the ground, your your perspective is much more different. So you have three different levels. So I cannot shoot standing up. I only can shoot kneeling down or shoot on the ground. So on the defensive side, when right. I'm trying to get defensive players or I'll do the same thing with the. Uh, uh, our, one of our cornerbacks or some of our linemen, you know, or, or you got the linebacker looking over the center and I'll be down low and shooting tight with the 300 as well, right? When they're closer. Now, as they start to move down the field, then I start going to my 400 millimeter lens and then, and, or the 600, or then I'll run around to the side and then start moving down the field with them as well. But that's why I have a 600. So I don't have to really move too much, but I can get as tight as I want to how I do the low angles with um, say if we're on offense, right? And so I'm usually say if I'm in the end zone, right? Left or right of the, the goalpost, right? And we're moving down the field and now we're in field goal range. We're right around the 20, 20 yard line. So now he's going to kick like a 30 yard field goal, right? I will jump up, grab my 300 millimeter lens, run around the side in between other photographers on the side, take off my eyepiece on the camera, Go in my think tank bag, pull out my angle finder. All This is all while I'm running, right? Put my eyepiece in the mouth, squeeze in between photographers. I will kneel low down on the ground. I will shoot a line shot with both the teams lined up before the snap. And then I pan over before the snap and I would get the kicker and the holder getting the field goal all in once, one shot. So I'm running, changing, doing all that. And I created really two different shots because we'll use that, that, that line shot as a header on the opponent that we played when they're down low. And you imagine, imagine I'm down low on the ground and then I pan over to get the, the field goal kicker all in one shot. And that's I how I do it. a lot of these, okay. a lot of these low angles. Low, I mean, I just love the low angles and I love using the the cannon angle finder well, like that. Because like you say, and it's the old saying of, if you're photographing a, a child, get down to their eye level. If you're photographing mm-hmm. it, because it, it changes the perception of their size, their power, all of that. You you sent me two clips. They're not long. This first clip mm-hmm. is 11 seconds long. And what yeah. I like about this clip is, you know, like right now he's moving. Mm-hmm. He's got the ball. You can see the play that you photographed happening, obviously assembled from Correct. stills that you shot. Correct. Yeah. Then the tackle afterwards when he gets back up, just And the fumble when he recovered the ball this, and everything. Yeah. Exactly. And it kind of puts into perspective what's happening in front of you during this. But the reason that I like this second clip as well, and the mm-hmm. second clip is only five seconds long. And before I play it, let me just set it up for people. Mm-hmm. This second video clip, the first video clip was a sequence of images from the shot that we're talking about today. Okay. But the second one is a completely unrelated set of shots other than the angle. And it just really shows the power of, of the angle as he receives the snap, runs back and looking at a quarterback, right? Looking at a quarterback as they're standing there, but quarterback standing, but you're down low. Right. Adds this giant, you know, power effect to it. It's awesome. When when you're done shooting, are there limits to what you can do in post? Like, are there photojournalistic? I mean, because really you're not shooting photojournalism. You're shooting commercial photography marketing. Correct. Yeah. But do they limit what you can do to the shots to oh, no. more the photojournalistic integrity no, rules? No, we don't really have any limits. I mean, you know, what we'll do is we'll, you know, check, uh, make sure exposures are looking good, things like that, you know, that is sharp. Because it's like one thing 
that I've learned from even, you know, from other photographers is like, it's like always show your best work. You know, if, 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 if right. it's soft or out of focus or just a little soft and not as sharp it, and, and just because you may have a certain shot, if you didn't really capture it tack sharp, nah, don't show it. You know, you just, you got to let it go. It's, it, it missed. Right. And so, you know, basically what I try to do even is produce an, a correct image inside the camera. It's like, to me, I said, you know, I just say, if it's garbage in, it's garbage out, right? So if you expose it right in camera, then it, it's like, you don't have to do too much in post. And think about it, 7,000 images, you want to be able to expose your images correctly. Sometimes the lighting is going to change real quick. You got to make adjustments in the camera. You got to be ready and so on and so forth. And my thing is you got to have a game plan going into when you're shooting. So I don't care if it's a corporate event, wedding, you know, um, uh, portrait, you, you always have to have a game plan before you execute what you're going to do. Because if you, if yeah. you're not ready, you know, you, it's like, you, you don't, you don't want to get ready while you're there, right? You want to be ready beforehand. And so, and in sports, it's all about anticipation. It's all about telling the story. It's all about, you know, how do you tell that story from the start of the game to the end of the game, right? Regardless if it's win or lose, right. it's like, how do you tell that story? And so, you know, you know, you look at us photographers as storytellers, you know, you want to see the story. You want to look into the image, like how you're looking into the image here. It's like, what's the story behind this image? What was, you, what were you thinking trying to get that shot? Because I had to have some thought right. into right. that. And that's where, yeah, that's why I look at it, approach it every game. So are you, for, for your type of work like this, are you a photo mechanic user, Lightroom user? A uh, photo mechanic. Use photo mechanic. Um, I'll use Lightroom uh, for certain things depending on what I'm going to be doing. Um, but basically, photo mechanic because, and then if we have to adjust images, you know, we'll group a bunch of images in photo mechanic, bring it in the camera raw, adjust them, and then put, bring them back in. And it, right, and it works right. just uh, okay. very quickly too, as well. Even when I'm doing um, uh, tagging images too in photo mechanic or, you know, and I also have a stream deck as well. So I like what you have there is, you know, oh. it's like I use that for, yeah. you know, I'll put in certain keywords for tagging images, like, you know, quarterback driving back to pass, great catch or run for a touchdown by, right. ball, you know, uh, individual things I like love that. The I stream deck. It's such oh, a yes. great piece of gear. Yeah, it is. And like I say, I'm always looking at, at technology. I want to get one better. tip from you before we close out. Okay. Because shooting what I shoot, I struggle with this and I know a lot of other people who struggle with this, but you do this at a level very few people do because you're shooting at 14 to 16 frames a second and you're holding that button down at times. Mm. Sometimes it is difficult when you shoot a burst and I'm just going to make up a number. You got a burst of seven shots of a sequence, mm. right? Guitar singer jumping in the air, quarterback throwing a pass, quarterback getting sacked, etc. Sometimes... Not always. Sometimes it can be difficult to pick which one in that sequence is the hero. Interesting. Okay. How do you decide? Well, that's the tough part. I mean, it's like for me, it, it's, I have a hard time selecting my own photos. It, it's like you see it oh, there. And you, and you just made and, me feel way better, by right. the way. It, it's like you, you have, like, say if you had 12 photos right there. Right. And you're going through them. And now it's it's almost like a fine tooth comb. Right. Because now you're 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 looking at saying, OK, is it this one, that one, this one? OK, let's see. I like that. But I like that. So then at some point you just got to pick. Right. Because between those last three or four or five that you're you're tussling with. Right. They're all good. Right. And so you you go with the one that you just like the most and you chose it from there. But it's hard, though. It, it is very hard. Now, I do often find. When I go back later on, like, you know, quote unquote off season, like, you know, looking at images from, you know, practice or pregame or some game highlights. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I see more stuff that I like even better where I have more appreciation later on. But when we're going, you know, I'm doing college on a Saturday, then NFL on a Sunday. And that's, you know, from August to January. I'm shooting game right. after game after game, editing picture after picture after picture. So it's kind of like, you know, you get kind of numb, but you know how to select real quick as well. But telling that story, tell, pulling those certain things out. Yeah. 
Exactly, exactly. A friend of mine, Troy Miller, said to me once, and I love this because he's a wedding photographer, actually, but an amazing photographer. And he said to me once, because I was struggling with a particular sequence, he goes, the client doesn't know the shots you don't show them. Correct. Oh, right? interesting. In other, yeah. words, yeah. in other words, if you quote unquote, grab the wrong shot out of the sequence, there is no wrong shot because they only see the one you gave them. Right. You know, yeah. it's that old, don't compare, you know. But, but then there's All also the one thing too. It's also one thing is like, are you are you giving your client too much or are you giving them too little? It's like you gotta you gotta draw that in between two as well. It's like, you know, there's no magic yeah, number, yeah. but yet it's like, you know, do you wanna give your client say if you're doing an event or certain thing, do you wanna give your client a thousand pictures or do you wanna give them the best three hundred and fifty pictures and have the right. others off to the, the side? The answer, by career. the way, should always be that second one. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, but then yeah. you don't want to give them yeah. just a hundred. Like, well, wait, this is all a hundred because once you right. know you go through it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so last question, and then for the those in the audio feed, uh, I will give out Terrell's you know social media links verbally so that you know what they are. But mm -hmm. last question, just really quick, um, if you were to recommend one photographer to people, who's the name people should look up? Oh, one photographer, and sports photographer. Or just in general, anything you want, man. Oh, no, you know, just they, in you yeah. know the daily inspiration. They have to go look at at person X's work. Well, you know, it, it's it's oh, that's a tough one. Now you then you go like, well, Tara's <laughs> like, well, why you didn't pick me and and so on and so forth. I mean, but I go back, I go back. If I had to look at when I was coming up, right, um, and and I may have to say two photographers. When I'm coming up and you look at the sports world, you know, it's it's you know Walter Eos is like one of my you know, favorite photographers I've, you know, studied after and looked at his work when, as I was trying to come up. And then, you know, and then Peter Reed Miller, which is a explorer of light photographer as well. I mean, you know, Peter great photographer. is one of the nicest yeah. human beings. Yeah. I mean, Just. these guys, these guys paved the way for what they were doing, you know, with Sports Illustrated and Super Bowls, World Series, you know, right. NCAA, NBA Finals, you know, things like that. But then there, there's a ton, you know, there's like, you know, Will Madonna that shoots for Sports Illustrated out of LA. I mean, great guy, always been personable with me, you know, when I came on the scene and and very pleasant. And, you know, we have, um, you know, it's, it's just so many out there that I try to emulate and really want to be like as well, you know, to be honest. And and I just do what I do because I have a love for what I do. I had a love for, you know, bowling on a press, professional bowlers tour, you know, and when I used to wear those rings and you walk in a bowling alley and people notice like, oh, that's Terrell Lloyd. Look, he got his PBA 300 ring on or or ABC 300 ring on, you know. And, you know, when I went into the corporate world, being, you know, starting off in the data center and then getting into networking and then project management and then, you know, honing my skills to get, you know, on the field with the 49ers and then get with them and and create, you know, an environment for where, you know, creating good images and surrounding myself by a good team and group of photographers that work with me to this day. And, and then, you know, to, you know, to Canon, to Sandis and to, to Think Tank for, you know, what they do for me and what, you know, and what I do for them and, and how I, you know, utilize their products and, and right. believe in the product. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's easy for me to stand up on a stage and, and, you know, talk about a product that you really believe in. Right. That you really, you know, the product sells itself. I don't have to push the product, but here's how I use the product. Here's the results from the product. So it, it's kind of like, you know, and it just validates, you know, the, the equipment that you use and, and going forward, really, to be honest. And it's easy. Like I say, I use all of that. Mm -hmm. I don't shoot a concert without think tank gear on me. Mm -hmm. Um and still to this day, it to me it's the best bags that there are on earth. Yeah. You you mentioned Peter Reed Miller and I just have to tell people, uh, Peter Reed's been on the show before. He's just a wonderful human mm -hmm. being. But we had a shot from the Olympics years and years ago of an archer at the bottom of the Olympic stadium shooting a flaming arrow up to the cauldron mm -hmm. to light the cauldron. And if you have not seen that episode, go watch that episode because okay. Peter is just absolutely amazing. So for this particular show, uh, Terrell's information, the blog post on him, the show notes, the links – the the images like a small gallery of his work are all up at behindtheshot.tv and please you can subscribe there as well and if you're an iTunes person or wherever you are please leave a star rating hopefully a good one 
but <laughs> whatever you feel honest, I mean, honestly, uh, and please drop a written review. It's always appreciated. So, uh, Tara, let's get through your information here really quick. Your website, TaraLloyd.net, right? Yes. TaraLloyd.net is my website. Um, and on Instagram, okay. it's 49ers official photog, or you can look it up by my name, uh, Terrell Lloyd. Facebook too. Yeah. Facebook, you can look it up by my name and I think I'd have it in there. It's 49ers official photog there as well. And then like Twitter is like, uh, and then Twitter T, is T Lloyd 49 on Twitter. And, it, and it's funny how, uh, uh, you know, I got that little handle T Lloyd, you know, people, when I got with the 49ers and instead of everybody calling me Terrell all the time, they used to say, T and then they would say T Lloyd. And then all of a sudden that, that came about too, as well. And then one little quick note, remember in the beginning, you asked me how that yeah. get started a little bit and, and how that get on the field. So remember I tell you, I went into the, this Hamburg place where a former player owned, right. With me and my son, and he was three, four or five years old. Well, my son now also right. works for the 49ers as an equipment manager. And he's been with us since 2012. He worked with the Arizona Wildcats when he was in college and worked with their football program. And so he's with uh, the Niners as well working with the uh, coaches that's players, cool and everything. yeah yeah so how ironic Talk about being yeah. a proud dad exactly exactly yeah that, that's pretty awesome well i can't say thank you enough for doing this it took us a while to get together mm. and i really appreciate your time being here and i've taken more of your time than i normally would so i apologize for that but it has just been an absolute joy for me to talk to you and i wish you well and i hope you have a fantastic summer and uh thank you I appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. You can go check out all the show notes, like I say, at BehindTheShot.tv. Real quick before I go, I do want to remind you about the critique shows that I'm doing with Don Komarechka. Don does the Photo Geek Weekly podcast, and he and I stream right now once a month, may do it more than that at some point, and we're starting to work on bringing in a guest each episode to do it with us, but we're streaming live image critique shows to the Behind the Shot YouTube channel once a month. If you want to get in on it, all you got to do is go over to Flickr, sign up for Flickr, can be a free account, join the Behind the Shot group, and then submit your images to the group. And here's the key. If you just submit an image, we may not critique it because we don't want somebody to submit one that's not comfortable with a critique. The way you specifically say, I want this image in the pool for possible critique is tag it with a Flickr tag, not a hashtag, tag it with a Flickr tag, BTS critique. That's what we search for. That's what we filter on, and uh, we should have one coming up. You know, usually it's it's the Thursday in between my normal episodes at the beginning of the month. So that does it for this show. Again, thank you so much for joining me. If you got any questions, feel free to reach out to me on social media. The easiest place is probably Twitter. It's at Steve Brazel, same as the country Brazil, but two L's. As always, drive safe out there. I hope that everybody is doing good, and thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next show. 